Hey everybody, this is Baker's Corner. Hope you're doing well. Uh, we're going to actually get into a very interesting presidency today. So we're actually back from some economic and social and cultural history to start to dive a little bit more <clears throat> again into political. And we're going to spend a lot of time the rest of this quarter actually looking a lot at the presidencies from you know Jackson. We'll do a little bit of jumping around and really where we'll end at <clears throat> is of course the very important presidency of Abraham Lincoln which leads us into the Civil War and shortly thereafter. So the big thing that we want to keep in mind, guys, with, Al or with uh, Andrew Jackson is that he's not a new name to us. And we'll look at this a little bit later, but he has a lot of links to an extent with the American Revolution growing up in that time. Um, and then also, guys, a lot of very interesting things come out of his presidency. Interesting, controversial, and also very impactful. For different groups okay so we're not going to do like a real drawn out list of objectives but a couple of things that we want to keep in mind guys with jackson how does his personality not only define him individually but also how does that affect his presidency right the way that he makes decisions the way that he actually goes about <clears throat> looking at issues and things any president's personality any person guys that holds a political position that definitely comes into play. I would say with Jackson, it's going to be maybe not more important, but it's certainly going to be a definitive part of what defines him as president. Okay. The idea of the common man is going to be very essential, guys, with this age of Jackson. Now, think about who we've already talked about. Who is a big advocate of the common man? And that's going to be Thomas Jefferson, right? So there is some commonality there. Now, I think if you go back and you look at a few uh, documents, guys, by Jefferson, Jefferson is a little bit more cautious to be, quote unquote, identified with Andrew Jackson because Andrew Jackson to somebody like Thomas Jefferson was a very dangerous individual. OK, and guys, remember, I mean, Jefferson lives until the year 1826. So Jackson is not president yet. But the way that he's going to go about splitting the party after election we'll look at, very important. Okay, the way that he basically uses presidential authority, okay, with making a lot of decisions, there are some cases to be made that he goes beyond the boundaries of our Constitution to be able to obviously do things like making the Cherokee move west and some other details along those lines, okay. Um, we want to also think about, guys, about the effects of his presidency, especially on the Native American population. I think a lot of you are already somewhat familiar with the famous, or at least heard of it, the Trail of Tears. What a lot of people, guys, don't think of as much is what's going to be really what should have happened. Well, we'll get into that in a moment. Jackson has a lot to say about the U.S. Supreme Court with an important court case, or at least a couple of them. Um, and then... What are the big issues, guys, with Jackson? The idea of the National Bank becomes a big issue, or I would say continues to become a big issue. The idea of the tariff pops up again. The idea of, of course, Indian removal. And then also the idea of how do you actually appoint people to positions within your administration? And more importantly, are they supposed to work for you? Or on the other side of the coin, are you supposed to work for them? Okay, Jackson is going to have a lot to say about that. Okay, and so let's go ahead and get started. So when we're thinking of Jackson, okay, the big thing, and guys, feel free to pause your screen if you need to, is a lot of us know that Jackson was president. What a lot of times is overlooked is the fact that you can make an argument, guys, with this election of 1824, that Andrew Jackson kind of gets the bad end of the deal here, okay? And if you look at the screen, you'll notice, guys, that this election <clears throat> is eventually going to be referred to as, by Jackson as the quote-unquote corrupt bargain, okay? So think about it in most presidential elections in the modern day. You probably have two candidates that stand out quite a bit. You know, this coming election, we hear about the Democratic candidate and the Republican candidate, and that, for the most part, is the majority of the attention brought, maybe an occasional third-party person at times, but for the most part, you hear the most about the two major parties. Well, guess what has happened? 
since the War of 1812. We've seen the dying out of the Federalists. So guys, for about nine years, between about 1816 and 1825 or so, we notice that we really have one political party that's going to be hosting a variety of different candidates. Now, this is not really a new thing. We've been seeing this ever since really the election of Washington. But the difference with this is that, remember, you've got a lot of attention brought to candidates that are all pretty much well-known. Jackson, you know, his famous background about being, you know, a general during the, uh, the War of 1812, during the Seminole Wars of the earlier 1820s, the late 18 teens. Okay, a lot of these things put him on the map. He, if you didn't know this, he was a house rep, he was a senator, he was a lawyer. So he has a lot of experience. Okay, um, John Quincy Adams, who's he the son of? Yeah, John Adams. John Adams is one of the two people in American history to ever, le to ever observe their sons actually becoming president and being inaugurated what <clears throat> the other one being you guessed it george hw bush in the earlier 2000s okay remember his claim to fame is very important as well he was a, a secretary of state under james monroe if you remember he was pretty much the so-called author <clears throat> of the monroe doctrine even though that doctrine is technically given to monroe, monroe as far as the name um very capable guys and so he's a well-known guy as well. Henry Clay. Where have we talked about Henry Clay before? Yeah. Missouri Compromise. Okay. Which comes before this time period, keep in mind. Um, the idea of internal improvements. All right. We'll look at that on the next slide with the, the, the division of political parties. And then a gentleman that you don't hear quite as much about named William H. Seward or Crawford, excuse me. Okay. Crawford is from the great state of Georgia, okay? And believe it or not, he was a, you know, he's not as well known as the other three that you see here, but he is going to be somebody that for the most part is a pretty well-known politician. So at the end of the day, I want you all to take a look at this slide. What happens? Well, you would think, given what you see on the slide and the outcomes, guys, keep in mind, the, uh, the popular vote is not what drives you know, the outcome. It's the Electoral College. But what is the total number of electoral votes? It's 261. Okay, so guys, if you're not careful, <clears throat> you look at the count and you're like, well, Jackson automatically wins. He's got the most votes. That's not what the way that the electoral college and the vote is supposed to work. You're supposed to receive what is called over a simple majority. So what does that mean? Well, think about it in modern terms. Modern meaning now. We have 538 electoral votes. You have to have a minimum of 270 to win. In this day, what the, what's the half number plus one? It's basically 131 out of 261. How many does Jackson win? 99, okay? And so think about what happened guys earlier with Jefferson in 1800, a very similar outcome. So if the Electoral College cannot determine the outcome, then who does? It's going to be the House of Representatives, okay? And what they do is they take the highest three number people in every state that has a, a, a member of the House, right? So any state that has House reps, they have one vote to cast for president, and whoever gets the highest number of those votes is actually going to become president. Okay. <clears throat> well, who is the odd man out? Henry Clay, who just so happens to be the, the, the Speaker of the House, which is an important position. So most historians agree that there's a little bit of a deal, corrupt bargain, as, uh, as Jackson calls it. And what happens? Well, the deal is, according to most historians, guys, that the deal is, is that they saw, at least Clay, and also um, to an extent, um, uh, what, um, John Quincy Adams, excuse me there, guys. Basically, it's like, okay, well, who do we really think poses the less threat to the office, you could argue. And so after, at the end of the day, what happens 
Well, Adams is pretty much going to advocate, hey, pick me. Clay, who has a, a quite a bit of a rivalry brewing between he and, and, um, and also Andrew Jackson, is actually going to sway the House to vote in favor of John Quincy Adams. Ergo, who's going to win the election of 1824? <clears throat> it is going to be John Quincy Adams. Now, let me ask you this. If you're Jackson, what can you do? You can pout, you can scream and holler, which I'm sure he did to an extent. But the other thing that you can do is you can say, well, you know what? Okay, y'all wanna play that way. I'm just gonna go and create my own party. Ergo, as you can see here, guys, again, the election does go to Quincy Adams. And so what Jackson does is he sets them up, guys, and this might be worth pausing for a moment to, to get these details. But what Jackson did is he says, okay, you know what? I'm going to just basically go out on my own terms and form my own party. So he kind of splits. If you remember the Democratic Republican Party of Jefferson, and he kind of takes it in his own direction. Okay. And so what do we notice? By 1828, <clears throat> the corrupt bargain has basically, at least this is one uh, so part of the story, guys. Basically, Jackson says, okay, I'm going to go out on my own. So we have this split in the political party system, okay? Split meaning Jackson takes it in one direction, the National Republicans are gonna result from the other side. Now, something for us to keep in mind, the National Republicans <clears throat> are gonna strongly resemble which previous political party? Think about it like this, what are they advocating for guys as a political party? The federal government, should be active. Think about what, what that means. They should pay for internal improvements. The American system of Henry Clay. They should support, according to their thinking, a national bank. And then also you'll notice a certain class of people are usually gonna identify more. So which political party of the early Republic most closely resembles this group? And think the party of Hamilton, the Federalists. Okay, federal government power. John Marshall, by the way, is still the US Supreme Court Justice. Okay, and so therefore they're set up, you know, they have a party. Okay, Jackson says, you know what? I'm gonna go in a little bit of a different direction. All right, so he, you can see pretty much a polar opposite of every issue. Federal government should be more inactive. Now, believe it or not, he does kind of go in his own direction here. We'll look at how he does that. So again, use of executive power and authority, okay? The individual state should be responsible for internal improvements, okay? I'll tell you a story about that in a moment. But at the end of the day, guys, what happens as a result of this is a humongous rivalry between him and Henry Clay. Remember, what state, guys, was Henry Clay from Kentucky, yeah, one of the earlier new states. And there was actually an attempt, guys, in Kentucky to actually want to put what was called the Maysville Road, which was basically kind of like the, uh, the National Road, but it was a different you know, road through Kentucky. And guys, that bill that was actually trying to advocate for that, that was a federal bill, was actually vetoed and vetoed and vetoed. Andrew Jackson was an extreme when it came to veto power. I'll tell you more about that here in a moment, but very important that we keep that in mind. Jackson is going to develop an eventual, you know, some historians would use the word hatred for the bank. It's kind of debatable, guys. Did he hate the bank itself or did he hate the fact that um, Henry Clay was a big advocate of that? I've heard both sides of the coin, okay? But one historian, I think, put it best. He said, and this is a perspective, keep in mind, but he said, it's not entirely clear whether or not Jackson hates the bank, but once Henry Clay gets himself involved in it, pretty much Jackson has, doesn't want to have anything to do with the rechartering the bank. Okay, so therefore you could argue, again, personality, personal vendettas that were very common to Jackson are going to be something that really leads him to do a lot of veto power, to do obviously a lot of things against the bank, et cetera, okay?
Now, this is what we're talking about to an extent when we mention that Jack and Jackson is going to be a really big advocate of the common man. Okay. The one thing for us to keep in mind, guys, with this common man idea is that you always hear a lot of times about universal white man suffrage under Andrew Jackson. There is truth to the fact that suffrage or voting, okay, is going to be expanded under Andrew Jackson. The downside is, is that it's going to be fairly limited to really white men. Okay, so you're not going to see really expansion for African Americans, women, and also Native Americans amongst other groups. So as you can imagine, that's going to be another big area of legacy. Um, is Andrew Jackson's era of, of Jacksonian democracy, is it really, truly democratic? And I would argue it very much depends what you define democratic to be. Okay, so just keep that in the back of your mind. So what gives Jackson, guys, this really solid resume? Well, you don't have to memorize these details, but just a couple of things to keep, at least in the back of your mind. He is a war hero. That Battle of New Orleans, as they called it, the nationalism that came out of this war that we've been looking at a little bit the last couple of weeks. Um, he is going to make some very controversial decisions, guys. He went into Florida without really the green light to do so when Monroe was in president, if you remember that. Monroe eventually sends John Quincy Adams <clears throat> to negotiate the purchase of Florida. Um, he, uh, Jackson, really, to my knowledge, doesn't take a lot of heat for it, but he makes a lot of very, very interesting and yet forceful decisions, okay? Um, and then he does have a quick fuse temper. All right, we'll talk about that more in a second. And why should we all care about Andrew Jackson? Money. The $20 bill, at least for the time being. Have any of you heard about in recent history, they're talking about the possibility of changing the 20? If not, kind of a neat little story. There's a strong possibility, guys, that in the near future, does anybody know who that is? Famous abolitionist female, Harriet Tubman. Yeah. So we'll see if that happens. I think they're, they're still planning to do that, but I think there's probably been a little bit of, of um, you know, shall we say, hold up with that, just with natural things that are going on and all that, okay? And so when we're looking, guys, at Jackson, there's four major big things, event-wise, that happen, <clears throat> excuse me, under Andrew Jackson's watch. The vetoing of the bank, Okay, which, by the way, is not going to be successfully rechartered under Jackson. I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. His use of patronage to actually fill government positions. Okay, and then the other two we'll look at on the next slide. So let's look at patronage first or patronage. So a lot of you guys might be wondering, <clears throat> what is patronage and what does this have to do with the spoil system? Well, if you look at your notes, your note guide or your course pack, the word spoil system and patronage are both defined there, I think it is. But the idea, guys, of patronage, <clears throat> for the most part, the big picture of it, and this might be worth maybe rewinding for a minute if you need to re repeat it, guys, is <clears throat> you're appointing government positions that are given to loyal party members. All right, so I'm going to repeat that for you. So with the system of patronage, guys, you're appointing government officials or people based off of them being loyal party members. Okay, so think about what that means to you all to be loyal. Loyal to me means that I can count on them, that they're people that I can trust, that I'm going to be in a position where I can actually <clears throat> be able to actually um, count on them to make decisions that I want them to perhaps, but that hopefully like Washington guys, Washington was very clear. Okay. I'm going to make the final decision, <clears throat> but I've got a really great cabinet and you know, yeah, Jefferson does resign partly over the neutrality pledge that he wasn't really in agreement with. But for the most part, guys, to my knowledge, there's not a lot of dismissals under Washington the same way that you're going to see with Jackson. What Jackson did, guys, 
if you take a look at the spoil system, this is actually Andrew Jackson's use of patronage within his presidential administration. Okay, so actually the quote that this came from, I believe it was from, from the victors be the spoil. Now, what Jackson essentially does is he literally <clears throat> wants people that are going to do exactly as he says. And so I'll tell you more about this uh, as we transition above. But the idea, guys, of Jackson is like in the case of the National Bank, he doesn't want to recharter it. And there's a problem. And the problem is, is that the recharter on this bank, so we're kind of transitioning guys to the next point to make this clear. So with the bank, <clears throat> you're, it's not supposed to basically cease or be rechartered until around 1836. So what happens around 1832, which by the way is Jackson's reelection year after 1828, 1832 is the next presidential election, Jackson, creates this plan, okay, to actually withdraw all the funds, in other words, remove all the money from it, et cetera, and actually put it into these state banks, almost like piggy banks, but they actually called them pet banks. Now, as you can imagine, what is the big question mark? <clears throat> Does he have the constitutional authority to do that? Well, this is obviously a tough one. And so Henry Clay, who's kind of like the architect of this moving forward, kind of like taking the place of, of uh, Hamilton, basically is like, nope, that's not right. You're doing this wrong. He tries to make this a political issue with the election coming up in 1832. Jackson refuses. He says, I'm not going to wait until 1836. We're removing the money now, and we are not going to recharter this bank. I will veto every attempt to do it. And guess what, guys? He does. Now, if you're kind of wondering, Mr. Baker, you've mentioned the word veto at least two times in this lecture discussion. I'm kind of a little bit unclear. Here's what a veto is. It's a presidential, <clears throat> it's a presidential power or authority, if you will, to actually reject a potential law of Congress. Okay. So imagine that you all are Congress, the Senate and the House. You pass a bill. You know, that bill could be we're going to recharter the bank, we're going to increase taxes, whatever. And it gets to Mr. Baker's desk. Let's pretend that I'm Jackson, whoever it is. And I veto it. Veto basically means that I am re rejecting it. Congress can override <clears throat> a presidential veto, but it's extremely difficult to do. And the reason being is because all it really takes to get a bill to the president's desk is a simple majority vote in Congress. That's kind of like the quick version. But if I veto your act, guess how much it takes for you all to override it? Two thirds, which as you can imagine is a much bigger majority. Now, so what happens? So Jackson rejects the bank. Again, I think a lot of it, guys, was Clay. Clay thought that this was going to be the eventual nail in the coffin of Jackson. He basically predicts, in a sense, that Jackson will not win this election of 1832. Clay ended up being wrong by a landslide. And Clay was actually the person that he was trying to defeat, okay? Successfully did defeat. Now, a lot of you guys are wondering, well, Mr. Baker, why is the veto important? Well, we've had between 1789 and 1829, we've had 40 years of presidential history between presidents like Washington and John Quincy Adams prior to Jackson. Do you all know how many vetoes all of those presidents combined actually used? I want to say it was eight. Eight. Do y'all know how many Jackson used in eight years? Twelve. Okay. Now, it is constitutional. It is in the Constitution that the president can veto. Okay. And so the question comes up, why is Jackson vetoing this? Why is he, you know, doing other things that involve veto 
vetoing the Maysville Road, you know, um, you know, the internal improvement bill that was also associated with Clay. If you go back and you were to ask, let's say that Washington were still alive and he did uh, take positions on this and you were to ask Washington, okay, why should a president really use a veto? Washington, from what I've read, guys, would say that you should use a veto only if you really believe presidentially that an act of Congress is not constitutional. Now, some of you might be saying, well, Mr. Baker, isn't that kind of taking the role away from the Supreme Court? Because after all, the Supreme Court has the right to interpret the law. Or remember what we talked about a few weeks ago, guys, with Marbury versus Madison just review. This is where Jackson, amongst other presidents later on, are going to say, you know what, the Supreme Court, you're not the only people that have an opinion on the legality of things. The president should have a right to have it as well. Okay. So he's going to really use the idea, guys, of this veto power. Now, there's a debate. I think if Jackson were here and you were to ask him or we were to ask him, kind of cool to Zoom with him, and ask him, okay, President Jackson, why did you veto the bill, whatever bill it would have been, I really do think that Jackson would try to make a, a, a pretty direct constitutional argument. Okay. But there is a case to be made that when you throw in the personal things, okay, Jackson actually, if you didn't know this guy, it's kind of a side story, but it, it kind of relates to this. Jackson's wife, Rachel, they never had any kids together. But one of the things that the opposition party tried to use to kind of smear Jackson a bit was the fact that Rachel Jackson, before she and Andrew tied the knot or married, was actually married to another man. Jackson starts courting her. Now, this was back in probably the, the later 1700s, 1780s, 90s, whenever it was. Um, and so not a lot of people were like, okay, well, that's years ago. Why focus on it? Well, what Jackson thought was that Henry Clay had stuff to do with that. And so some of this went out in the public and newspapers. You throw in addition to that, and Jackson, guys, is again going to bring a lot of personal things into the presidency. Okay, so the bank does not cease to exist beyond the era of Jackson, which we'll look at the effect of that here in a few minutes. And Jackson does try to make it to where he's putting people in political offices that will follow his suit. Here's the thing that's interesting. So when he makes this decision about the bank, and we'll move on to the next slide, guys, in a moment, but this is important. His secretary of the treasury is key. And so he's like, hey, I want you to do this. The Treasury secretaries, at least the first few, the names aren't important, were very kind of on the fence. They're like, nah, we don't think we should. We don't think this is constitutional. It's not right. Jackson would fire them. So he went through, guys, these positions through the spoil system, almost like you and I would a sock drawer. You're not doing what I want. You're fired. Let's put someone else at will. Okay, and it comes head to head when eventually the head of the bank, a gentleman by the name of Nicholas Biddle, B-I-D-D-L-E, is actually going to try to take um, um, Jackson on. Jackson, at the end of the day, is going to win the battle because eventually, as we know, the bank does die. Okay. Now, what are the other two major issues that, that Jackson dealt with? Basically, the idea of the tariff issue resurfaces, and then also the issue of the Indian removal, which is probably the most well-known of the issues of Jackson's time to most students already. Okay, so we'll spend just a few minutes on that. But guys, what is a tariff? This should be a review for you all. Yeah, it's a tax on an import. The South was the most opposed to the tariffs, okay? For a variety of different reasons, um, the North is supportive because remember most of the industry that we associate with manufacturing is northward. Okay, northward, northward, excuse me. Okay, and so what happens in the late night or 1820s, early 1930s, is we have the Congress that passes what what was what was called the Tariff Act, but according to the Southerners, especially South Carolina, they called it the Tariff of Abominations because it actually increased the tariff, which was not popular. Why is South Carolina important? Well, a couple of things. First of all, 
the first vice president of Jackson was a gentleman by the name of John C. Calhoun, who is a South Carolinian. He thinks that just because he and Jackson are both from the South, they both own slaves and plantations and land, and they both produce things, he thought that because we're from the same region, Jackson is basically going to support me. This is where Jackson is going to be a lot like Abraham Lincoln, guys, in that union is number one. Okay, so in other words, think about what we talked about with nullification way back during the era of, of J John Adams when, you know, you had these alien and sedition acts that were passed and states didn't like it. Well, guys, in the case of the tariff abominations, essentially, when South Carolina steps out and they said, okay, we should be able to nullify this law, think back to the definition of nullification or nullify, it means that we had the right to reject it. Jackson is all about state rights. But in this case, guys, he is not going to compromise the sake of the union due to a disagreement by South Carolina. Now, to give you an idea how adamant he was about South Carolina not nullifying, okay, South Carolina basically threatens, you know, to, to potentially leave the union. They do, of course, later, the first state to leave during the Civil War time period. Okay, Jackson guys get this. First of all, does not like Calhoun. And he basically tells South Carolina, he goes, and this is, a, uh, this is kind of a paraphrase, guys. But in a sense, he says to South Carolina, try me. If you basically think that you have the right to nullify this law and you're going to try to reject it, what he threatens to do to talk about Jackson, guys, he says, I am basically going to raise an army marched into your state. And I think it was even guys recorded that he even made a threat to Calhoun that he would hang him from the first tree of his home state. I don't know about all of you, but that kind of brings me back to three principles. You don't spit in the wind. You don't tug at Superman's cape. And you don't basically make Andrew Jackson angry. Okay. And I think it was recorded after that, guys, that Calhoun was, quote, unquote, genuinely scared for his life. Duh. <laughs> you know, you've just been threatened. This is a sign of things to come. Okay. So very important that we keep that in mind. Now, what about this issue, guys, of Indian or Native American removal? Okay. Well, this is actually where Congress supported the removal. So this act right here is worth getting down. So Congress passes what became known as the Indian Removal Act of 1830. I don't really care if you memorize the date as long as you can associate it with Andrew Jackson's time in office. Now, this is his first term. He's only been in office for about a year. Okay, remember, he's a two-term president. So what happens? Well, the Cherokee, who eventually are one of the five tribes that are affected by this, think that this is not a constitutional thing. In other words, they should not have to move from territory and therefore be moved further west. West of the Mississippi River is pretty much what we're talking about, by the way. Okay. And so what did they do? Well, they sued. That's the reason why in the early 1830s, we're going to have basically what we call Worcester versus Georgia. Georgia was thinking, okay, you know, they should have to move. You know, the Congress has passed a law. Now, let me ask you this. Does Congress have the rightful authority to interpret the law? The answer is yes. Why? Judicial review. Okay? So Congress hears this case. Or excuse me, Supreme Court hears this case. Okay? And guess who they ruled in favor of? The Native Americans. My question to all of you is, before we wrap this up, why did they have to move? Okay, if the Congress spoke, the Supreme Court basically heard the case, they ruled in favor of the Cherokee, you would think it's open and shut. We don't have to move, therefore we're going to stay put. Okay, Jackson, this is a case, guys, where he does side with state rights. State rights, excuse me. So he kind of sides with Georgia here. 
And essentially, guys, again, remember his view, the Supreme Court is not the only branch of our government that has the right to interpret our Constitution. So what does Jackson do? Jackson basically says to the Supreme Court, it's kind of like him defying the court. And he basically says, you've now made your decision. Now it's up to you to enforce it. Now, my question to all of you is this. And if you don't know the answer, I'm going to give you an example in a second down the line. The president is supposed to execute the law, right? I and mean, that's essentially the executive branch's duty, or one of them. You execute the law, Congress passes it, the Supreme Court interprets it. The question I have for all of you to think about, guys, hypothetically, and maybe even you know, on your own time, is Jackson being unconstitutional? with how he's acting here. And the reason I ask that is that down the line, fast forward the clock over a hundred years, we have a, another big Supreme Court case that deals with a different issue, but unless it's still pretty big, and that is the issue of Brown versus Board of Education. Now, for those of you that may have taken civics, you've heard of that. If not, then the basic nuts and bolts of Brown is that we had a policy called segregation being quote unquote separate but equal that went all the way back to 1896. The Supreme Court case that preceded it, we'll study later, so don't worry about it. Who was in office during Brown? It's a gentleman by the name of Dwight D. Eisenhower. And by the way, this is Eisenhower's first term. Sound familiar? Yeah. Eisenhower has a decision to make. Do you support the court? And there's different speculation out there about whether or not he thought that this was more of a states' rights issue or more federal. But guys, at the end of the day, according to someone like Eisenhower, Eisenhower is going to say, okay, the Supreme Court spoke. It's my job, my role, my duty, if you will, to follow it through. Um, it's kind of an interesting story, guys. He gets a letter from his brother, amongst other things, basically telling him, hey, you know, this is not something – that we think that is a good idea for you. Why are you doing it? And essentially, guys, you know what he tells the, his brother in a private letter at the time? He said, for the most part, he goes, the Constitution means what the Supreme Court says that it means. Okay. Now, why do I bring up that story? Because not every president is going to have the same opinion about adhering to the Supreme Court or not as Jackson will. Okay. But guys, as you can imagine, what happens? Jackson makes it clear to the Cherokee. Uh, let me show you the next slide, guys, with the map here. You can pause it if you want to. This is why we basically have the Trail of Tears. Okay. So all these different tribes, as you can see, the Seminole, um, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Cherokee Creek. Okay. They're all going to be going, as you can see, west of the Mississippi River in this area that we currently call Oklahoma, or right, the Indian Territory is what it's going to be known as before. Um, this guy has a big, big effect. And in Jackson, if you want to read the document, guys, I've got it. But Jackson basically makes it clear. He's like, hey, you know, the other alternative here is assimilation pretty, pretty much. Assimilation meaning that you're going to adopt the culture of the dominant group which according to Jackson would have been basically white settlers. Okay. And so therefore, that's why we have the Trail of Tears. Okay. One historian put it like this. This is probably the biggest blemish of the Jackson years. Okay. So I'll let you all kind of land your plan on whether you agree or disagree based off of the other issues that we just looked at, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, Jackson does successfully get elected to a second term with overwhelming support. I mean, some people would say a landslide. Okay. His legacy is going to be, for some of you guys, we'll be doing a little exit ticket for the lesson today. So please follow the directions on Canvas for that. Um, but guys, this is really important. Some of you are going to be doing a little activity with this political cartoon. I mean, guys, pause it and ask yourself this question. Essentially, is this cartoon more pro-Jackson or more anti-Jackson? I mean, what stands out to you? I'm not going to give it away because that'll give us something to talk about next time. Okay. 
But Jackson, guys, there is no question in my mind that one of the biggest effects of Andrew Jackson's presidency is definitely going to be expanding executive power. That might be worth noting. That is a big picture thing, guys, whether you're looking at the way that he dealt with the bank, the way that he actually used the spoil system to put different people in political positions, the way that he used authority. Now, the question I like to ask students, guys, with that whole South Carolina nullification crisis, we talked about a crisis under Washington that was called the Whiskey Rebellion. It wasn't identical, but it still was over partially on taxes. My question to all of you is that, you know, is this a different approach to handling what I would call a domestic crisis? Okay. Does Jackson have a responsibility to actually make it clear to the people of South Carolina and other states, you know what, this is a federal law. You don't like it. It's still law. You know, we can change it, which eventually they do pass a, um, an act later that does modify it, but you still have to follow the law per the guidelines of the way the Constitution is. All right, ergo, respecting the union and also the federal government. Okay, a lot of you guys might be wondering, and I'll end with this for the moment, what's gonna be the long-term effect of the bank basically closing or being forced to close? And the answer is we really don't have an equivalent of that to do things at the federal level. This does not bode well for the successor of Andrew Jackson, all right? Andrew Jackson's successor, a gentleman by the name of Martin Van Buren. Um, he is the second VP of Jackson. Van Buren is kind of like a hand-picked successor. He is a Jacksonian Democrat, as they become known as, okay? And the one thing, guys, that's really interesting is that the year that Jackson left office is 1837. That's the same year that he passed the church to Van Buren. Guys, guess what happened? Remember a few weeks ago, we said that anytime that we hear the word panic associated with the economy, it's usually not gonna be in good terms. We have the second big major, I should say, in the history of the US at this point in time, the second biggest depression that we call the panic, or, or some people call it the, the um, depression of 1837, okay? And a lot of people throw a lot of attention on Jackson there. You know, could this have been avoided had he not had maybe that attitude toward Clay and therefore, you know, let the bank continue and, and so forth, but that's not the reality, okay? I'll end, you, I'll, I'll end you all guys with this, kind of a fun little story with Jackson. Um, a lot of you guys are probably well aware that Jackson was not popular in all circles. He loved to duel. Um, he actually was evidently pretty good at it. Had a couple of bullets in his body from surviving duels. But there was an occasion um, toward the end of his life. He lived, by the way, until the year 1845. All right, so he sees about another uh, president beyond Van Buren. Van Buren is one term. He was so unpopular, they called him Martin Van Ruin. But anyway, but Jackson, guys, for the most part, um, is really going to be that president that just, you know, you either loved him or you hated him. And there was an occasion that I heard that, you know, there was an occasion where a gentleman, uh, I, from what I understand, Jackson was the first president with a true assassination attempt. And the guy tried to shoot Jackson and evidently one or two things happened. Either the gunpowder didn't go off the way it was supposed to, or the other thing I've heard, guys, is that the gentleman had these, these uh, guns in his pockets and the bullets ran out of the pockets. So when he fired it, it had no bullet to begin with. And evidently, guys, Jackson was so old and so kind of like at the point where his health was deteriorating. But at this moment, I guess it was adrenaline setting in or something. He kind of throws the two people, kind of like bodyguards or people that helped him walk and stuff off. And I think he had a cane or something, you know, not a scepter. That's obviously uh, just for the visual. And he basically, I guess, put a beat down on this guy. I don't know what happened to the guy afterwards. I haven't researched that. But that is Andrew Jackson in a nutshell. All right. I hope you've enjoyed that. Guys, check Canvas. Um, you've got some activities to do for the day um, and uh, so forth. 
Um, so there's no thing here. But as always, guys, feel free to uh, email me at bakerd at franklincomedy.org. And again, it's been great being with you. Hope you all are doing well. Next time, we will continue the Lenny layer of um, the Jacksonian legacy as we transition not to the next president after Bram Buren, but a few after him, which will be uh, James K. Polk. And we'll look at one of the bigger issues, guys, entering the, the later 1840s, which is Manifest Destiny. Have a good one, and I'll look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.